All right, we are back. We've got Elton, and Elton is going to talk to us about putting the .NET into Kubernetes, two of my favorite topics these days, .NET and Kubernetes. Right on. Can you hear me? I can hear you now, yes. You can hear me now. Perfect. <laughs> all right. Whenever you, I'm still trying to figure out these buttons. I'm going to have it all figured out when it's my turn to leave the studio and be replaced by somebody else. <laughs> And then I'm going to keep it tribal knowledge <laughs> whenever you're ready. OK, to, to share my screen, ready to go? Yep. OK, excellent. So let's do the right screen. OK, how's that looking? Perfect. Excellent. excellent. OK, so uh, let's get to my PowerPoint here. So hey, thanks for joining everybody. Uh, my name's Elton. Uh, I work for Docker. This session is all about uh, .NET applications in Kubernetes. So I've been using uh, before I joined Docker. I was a uh, I was a, uh, a, a a consultant working on big .NET projects. I've been an MVP for ten years now. Uh, I was working with .NET from the very first version back in two thousand and two. One of the things I really like about the framework is that it's it's longevity. You know, you can take those apps from two thousand and two, and you can run them on all the newest platforms. And this session is all about doing that with Kubernetes. So there's a couple of things I'm going to cover. Uh, start with a few slides. I'm going to talk about, like, I'm going to give you some 101s, because I know this is this is a new topic for a lot of people. I've been working with Docker since the earliest version. So like, and if, you, if, you're, if you're with me on there, then the first few slides will be stuff you already know. But uh, I'm going to get, get everyone on the same level, talking about what Docker is, how .NET fits in, uh, what Windows containers mean in, in Docker and in Kubernetes. And then most of the session is going to be demos. So I'm going to do a bunch of demos uh, running some brand new .NET Core 3.0 apps, uh, building them in Docker, running them locally on my machine, and then running that exact same app in Kubernetes uh, with the Azure Kubernetes service. So I'll do that with a brand new .NET Core 3 app running in Linux containers. And then I'll use the exact same process, the same tools, and the same frameworks to do it with a very old .NET app uh, running on Windows. So that's that. That's the session today. OK, so the very first thing. So if you're not familiar with Docker, like primarily it is a packaging distribution and runtime for applications. So what you do with Docker is you have your Windows server or your Linux server. You install Docker on it, and you don't install anything else, because everything else that's gonna, that your application needs is going to come through the container. The way you make that happen is you write this script, which, which is basically an installation script that says all the bits and pieces that your app needs. That's called a Docker file. Uh, and what that might look like for an old, uh, let's say, a .NET Web Forms app, it's basically a list of all the components that you need. So uh, I'm a Windows app, so I need to start on a version of Windows, Windows Server Core. I'm a web app, so I need IIS. I'm a .NET app, so I need .NET. And I'm ASP.NET, so I need ASP.NET installed and configured. And then right at the top there, I, I package my own web application, which would be the binaries or the content, the HTML and JavaScript, and uh, any configuration that I need. So I write this thing called a Docker file, which describes all those steps. I run this command, docker image build, and that produces this thing called an image, which is just a, a static package that contains everything in my application. And I can share that. Now, that Docker file that I've talked about that does all those steps uh, could be something as simple as, as this. So this Docker file, uh, it, it actually is the previous, the previous diagram. So this requires IIS and .NET and ASP.NET. But that first line, that from line, says use somebody else's Docker image. This happens to be a Microsoft image. And that's already got everything I need. So it's got IIS, it's got .NET, it's got ASP.NET already configured. So everything my application needs is already there right in that first line. So, and then the next stage, imagine this is an old application. I've already got a build process that gives me an installer, a Windows MSI. I want to just see how that looks in Docker. This is literally all I need to do. I copy in my MSI and that run command, this all happens within Docker. It's going to run MSI exec to deploy my application from my MSI. You're not necessarily going to do this with your new applications, but it's a good way to see how, they, how your old applications, your old Windows apps are going to look in containers. For a new app, it's going to look something more like this. So it's the same syntax. It's the same few commands that you need to understand. The words in blue there, they're the, they're the Docker syntax. Most of what you're going to do, though, is, is just run scripts inside that inside this Docker file. This is a bit more complicated. This is my brand new .NET Core application. And this does a bit more than the previous example. Firstly, there are two parts to this. So the first part is going to compile my application from source code. So you see here the from line is saying, use an image that Microsoft own. So there's a public images. Microsoft maintain them. Every time there's a Windows update or, or a, a .NET update, they push out new versions. 
This is using a version, this is using an image that's got .NET Core installed, and it's the SDK. So it's got everything you need to build and package your applications. The rest of the, of the lines here copy in the source code from whichever machine that's running Docker, and then run .NET Publish, which is exactly what you would do if you were building it in, uh, in a CI system or locally on your machine. This all happens within Docker. And then the second stage starts from the .NET runtime. So this has got ASP.NET. This doesn't have the SDK, so I can't build an app because when I'm running my container in production, there's no need for me to have the SDK. I just need the runtime. So this starts from the ASP.NET runtime. Uh, it specifies what to do when the application starts. So that entry point line says run.NET with my DLL. And then it copies everything that was built in the previous stage. So the, 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 previous, um, the previous example that I showed you, you need to have a bunch of stuff first. So you need to have something, a process and a machine that can build your MSI, but it's very quick to get up and running. This version, you don't need anything at all because all you need is Docker and your source code and everything you need to build your app and compile your app and run your app is going to come from Docker. So it's a really nice way to, to make everything super portable. Okay, so when I've built my image and I've run through that, that Docker file, so what Docker will do is effectively execute each line in that Docker file and it will build me this thing called a, called a Docker image. That lives on the machine where I did the Docker build, and I can push it to a thing called a registry. So that's Docker Hub, or as your container registry, or a local registry, or whatever you're doing, or GitHub packages, which is just a store for all these images. So I can share that now. And then anyone who has access to that image, because I could make it public or private, anyone who has access can do a Docker run, and that will bring that container image onto their machine, which brings everything with it. So everything that you've packaged comes down with that container image, and then the container will start. So your application will start. The actual process for your app is going to run on the server directly because that's the way containers work. But everything the application needs comes packaged with that container image. So my server doesn't need IIS or .NET. And if I'm running several containers with different versions of .NET, they're all completely isolated. So that's the kind of basics of containers. And of course, it's the same with Linux too. The commands are the same. The Docker file syntax is the same. When you run your container, it's a Linux container. It needs to run on a Linux server. But the syntax is the same. I bring that down. This may be based on Debian or a lightweight Linux uh, uh, version. Uh, it's got .NET Core installed and ASP.NET Core and my web app. And the application that's running is, is the .NET runtime. But it's exactly the same set of tools, same set of artifacts to run your, your old Windows apps on .NET Framework or your new apps running on, on Linux. OK, so <laughs> that's your introduction to, to Docker. Now, what you could then end up with is uh, because your Linux containers have to run on Linux servers and your Windows containers have to run on Windows servers, uh, you end up needing to kind of join these things together. That's where Kubernetes comes in. So what Kubernetes can do is it can, you can take a bunch of servers, a bunch of Linux machines, a bunch of Windows machines. You install Docker on all of them. And then what you end up with is a bunch of isolated machines that can all run containers individually. But then you deploy Kubernetes and you turn the whole thing into a cluster. You can treat it like one big, uh, one big uh, platform where you're just going to throw your apps and it's going to decide what to do with them. Now, I haven't got time to go into Kubernetes in any depth, but basically what it is, is it's a container uh, orchestrator, so it manages where the containers run. So you, you manage your, your, your Kubernetes cluster remotely. So I can use my laptop, I can connect to my Kubernetes cluster. When I want to deploy an application, I send Kubernetes a description of what the pieces that the app needs uh, in a YAML file. It's called your application manifest that says, I need, this, I need this, this container and I want five of them. I need this container, I want 10 of them. This one has to run on Windows. This one has to run on Linux. You throw that to Kubernetes and it makes all the choices for you about what's going to run where. So it might run some on one server and some on another server. And then it monitors the whole thing and guarantees you your, the service levels that you've specified. So if I need 10 containers running my web app to get to get scale and, and failover, uh, if three of those are running on one of my Linux servers and that server dies, then Kubernetes will see that server's gone. It's taken three containers with it. So I need to start up another three somewhere else on the cluster to maintain the service level. So the reason why Kubernetes is so exciting and why people are really interested in it is if you if you build your app and package your app with Docker to be uh, to be self-healing, then you can get these kind of autonomous systems where you throw them the application manifest. They work out what to do with it. They keep it up and running. They keep it healthy for you. And so they're kind of self-operated. OK, and this is what that application manifest looks like in Kubernetes. This is a simplified version because the Kubernetes uh, the Kubernetes manifest spec is quite involved. But there's there's two parts to this. There's uh, the, top the top element here is a service, which is basically just um, something that will let network traffic from the outside world 
into your containers. So this is saying I'm listening on port 8081. So any traffic that comes into Kubernetes from the outside world on that port is going to go into a container on port 80. And in this case, the container is going to be this .NET conf to-do list, which is my .NET core container. So the second part is the deployment that says this is the container that I want to run. That's going to deal with the traffic that comes into the service. There's way more to Kubernetes than that, but this is just to give you a bit of a, a, bit of a grounding so that the demos make sense. And then all the rest of this session is going to be demos until we come back and recap at the end. OK, so I'm going to move on to my demos now. Let's open VS Code. So first demo is I'm going to take a, uh, a .NET Core 3.0 app, uh, and I'm going to run it locally. And then I'm going to push it up to AKS, my Azure Kubernetes cluster, and see how it looks in Azure. So uh, the, all the code I've got is on GitHub. Uh, the final slide I've got is a whole bunch of links that will show you where all this stuff is. You don't really need any prereqs in order to do this yourself. You just need Docker Desktop, which runs on Mac or Windows. You can get the source code. You can try it all yourself. And then there's actually in the uh, in the README for today's session, there's instructions how to spin up an AKS cluster, so you can try it on AKS too. Okay, so this is the Docker file for my .NET Core app. There are two parts to it, like in the, the example I showed you. It starts from the .NET Core SDK. Microsoft owned and maintained that. It's got all the tools. I copy in my source code. I do a restore to get my packages, and then I do a .NET publish. There's this thing here, which is about the runtime ID, and I'm using advantage of a, a new .NET Core 3 feature which is uh, in here, that I can publish a single file, and I can publish it trimmed. And um, those two things together mean I don't need the .NET Core framework deployed in my container at all. I'm just going to get a single binary, which has got my whole application. This happens to be an ASP.NET Core application, but I don't need ASP.NET Core uh, deployed to my container because everything's in my application. So this gives me a super, super lightweight uh, container runtime. OK, so the way I do this is I'm going to, I'm connected to uh, a Linux machine. So I'm running on Windows here, but I'm connected to Docker on Linux, which means I can build this to run on Linux. If I clear this down and just do a build. So that's going to run through all the steps in my Docker file. And you'll see it was it was like ridiculously, suspiciously fast because I've already run it today. And if nothing changes, if none of the source code changes, if none of the Docker file changes, then all that stuff comes from the cache. So you'll see all these lines here. Each of these lines from the Docker file says using cache. Now, if I run this without the cache, so I can say no cache, you'll see a bit more familiar output. So each of these steps are going to be executed. Now, this is running on my Linux machine. You'll see I've come into the .NET restore part. So I copy in the csproj file into my Docker image. That's all I copy to start with. Then I run the restore, because that might be um, a time-consuming process. And then I copy in the rest. Uh, and then I, do, I go and do the build. And you'll see now the, the, the build engine starts. It's doing the .NET publish, which is going to actually do the, the single file packing and the trimming and all that stuff. So that, that takes a little while. So you'll see this is just and the, the output here. All these lines of output are just what you would normally see in Visual Studio or VS Code. If you're doing this as part of your CI CD pipeline, then you will see all this in the output too. So it's nothing different. It's just a different way of, of actually running these things. OK, I'm going to kill this because the, the compression of all the bits and pieces takes a little while. And I already have a version that's built. So I'm going to run that container from the version that I've oh, actually, I'm going to show you. I'll show you the difference between some of these, uh, these new options that you've got with .NET Core 3. So I've built a few of these images already. I've built them with different variations of those uh, single file and trimmed stuff. So uh, this is the, the biggest version. If I run that without the single file and without the trim, then it ends up being 200 odd megabytes. If I include the single file and the trimmed flags, then it comes down to 170 megabytes. What that means is that entire package, which has got uh, Debian, it's got the Linux operating system, it's got uh, my binary for my application, it's got enough bits of, of .NET Core to be able to run the website, it's got all my, all my dependencies, all my configuration, the whole thing comes in at 170 megabytes, which is pretty much as small as you're going to get a, a full ASP.NET Core app. OK, so that's the difference those new flags mean. So if I run this, so I'm going to do a Docker container run. So imagine I, I, could, put, I could share this now with a, with a Docker hub, as you already have. So if you want to try this yourself, you can. These flags here just mean it's a background container. So detach it, put it in the background. It's going to keep running. And this flag means I want to send traffic into my host on port 8098. And that's going to go into the container on port 80. So again, I'm zipping through this. I just want you to get a feel for how this stuff works. OK, so I'm going to run this container. And then I'm going to open Firefox and browse to that app. This is the machine that I'm connected to, my Linux machine. And this, uh, 
I'm afraid to say it's another to-do list application. They're really easy to write. So they're good to they're good for demos. I've got nothing in here right now, and this is connect. This is running on a local SQLite database that's inside the container. Uh, I've got a to-do list here. It's all empty. I could put some new items in, but I've got a diagnostics page, which is really handy for me to see what's going on. This is the name of the container. This is the version of .NET that's running, so I can see it's uh, it's running on Preview Nine actually. Uh, I've got the operating system architecture and the description. So I know it's Linux, I know it's running on Intel, I know it's running on .NET Core. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. If I want to deploy this to Kubernetes, let's go back here, close this down. Here's my application manifest. So what this is saying is, again, it's a slightly more elaborate version of the one I showed you in the slides, but it's the same principle. I've got a service here, which is the entry point to my app. So Kubernetes will listen on port 8081. It'll send traffic into my to-do list container on port 80. When I scroll down here, this is describing how Kubernetes should run that container. So this is the version of my container uh, that I've already pushed to Docker Hub. So I've done the Docker image push. This is all ready to go. I've got my ports that I'm exposing. There are a few other bits and pieces here. So I'm taking, uh, I'm taking configuration from the cluster. So I've created some configuration settings in Kubernetes. Now, this is one of the great things about these platforms is that you can separate your application from the runtime config. So the app has enough logic inside it to look in this particular path. And if it finds a bunch of config files, it'll use them. And those config files aren't there in the Docker image. They are provided by the runtime. So Kubernetes has this, has this configuration deployed. When the container runs, that configuration gets injected from Kubernetes into the application. It sees them there and it configures itself. So I've got one Docker image that I can run in dev, in test, in UAT, in production, and just apply the configuration from the platform. So this thing is really portable. So that's, that's an important thing to have. OK, so I'm going to go over to Azure here. I'll see if my cloud shell is still running. Yeah, OK, cool. So I've got a resource group here with a bunch of things for today's demos. I've got a Kubernetes service that has some Windows and some Linux nodes. I've got a SQL Server database that I'm going to use later. And I've also got a Postgres database, which I'm using for my to-do list application. So the to-do app that I'm running locally, I've just run it in a container using SQLite. It also has enough logic using EF Core to go and talk to Postgres. And that's what I'm using in Azure. So in my Cloud Shell here, uh, uh, I'm going to kill this sleep. Uh, I'm ready to <laughs> switch between Linux and Windows. Uh, I'm ready to deploy this because I've already got everything set up. So if I do a kubectl, kubectl is the command line to deal with Kubernetes. Kube, other people pronounce it different ways. It's officially pronounced kubectl. Don't let anyone tell you different. So kubectl get nodes will tell me what machines are running in my cluster. Now I've got two Linux machines, two Windows machines. So I can run a variety of different applications. But the way I deploy them and manage them is, is all exactly the same. So if I look at the secrets that I've got, these are the configuration items that I've deployed. So I've already got ones set up. I've got my in here in my to-do list config. I've got a um, all the information to connect to Postgres. So if I describe that particular secret, which is called to-do list config, inside here there are two files, JSON files, and inside the secrets.json is the connection string to Postgres. So as a Kubernetes administrator, I can go and look at that, but no one else can see that stuff. Okay, so. Now I will go and deploy my app. And I've already got that, that same YAML file that I've just shown you is already on here. Uh, let's see where I am. So let's do it to .NET Comp and apps. No, let's have a look. OK, so I can. So the way I deploy my application, I've got this YAML file, and I do kubectl apply. And what that does is it's a, it's a desired state system. So Kubernetes is going to take the description that I've got in this YAML file, uh, that's my desired state. It'll look at what's currently running, and anything that needs to change, it will change. So I can see I've already created the service because that service creates me an Azure load balancer with a static IP address. I want to keep that. But my deployment is new, so it's deploying my application now. If I do a kubectl get all, you will see I've already got a few things running. So here's my, my new thing, which is my to-do list web application, which has started 25 seconds ago. Uh, all these bits and pieces are how Kubernetes does the different layers of, of my application. So that's all up and running. That all looks good. And if I browse to this application now, if I do kubectl just to be sure, get service, these are the these are the external entry points. So here's my to-do list web. This is the load balancer, so it gets created by AKS, integrates with the rest of Azure, creates a, a real Azure load balancer, gets me an external IP address, and it tells me what ports I can use. So if I switch back to my test browser, 
This is now my hitting my AKS version, which is talking to Postgres. It's a brand new deployment. This is a brand new container using the same container image that I've run locally. I've already pushed it to Docker Hub. Uh, Kubernetes is able to pull that down. Um, because of the of the, the secrets inside, the configuration, uh, it's already set up to connect to Postgres, and Postgres has some data already in there. So I've already been putting stuff in here. Um, the one good thing about this to-do list is uh, it really so, so, uh, suits my workflow. You can put new items in, but you can remove them. So if you've got a workload like mine, this is this is perfect for you. If I go to diagnostics here, you'll see actually this is a slightly different version because I'm running the release version of .NET Core 3, uh, but I'm running x64, I'm running Linux. So it's the same app, it's connected to Postgres because it's getting the config it needs from Kubernetes. So same, same workflow, but a really nice way to do the deployment. Okay, so that's a brand new app. So that's fairly straightforward. What about my old app? So uh, as part of my uh, my kind of taking the oldest apps I can find, I've got a Docker file here that's going to package up Nerd Dinner, like the original Nerd Dinner from 2006 or whatever it was. The Docker file syntax is the same. Uh, this, there's a few more pieces in here because it's a more complicated app, but actually the, the structure is exactly the same. I'm starting from uh, a .NET framework uh, image. So again, Microsoft own this, they keep it up to date. This is based on Windows Server Core and it's got the full .NET framework for me. I'm copying in the package config and doing a new get restore. So ex exactly the same patterns, excuse me, same patterns to build my application, copy in the rest of the source code and run MS build. So all fairly straightforward. The application image has already got um, ASP.NET 4.7 installed. And then I'm doing all this weird stuff, which is to do with setting up IIS so I can get the logs out of the container. Uh, I then copy in my application down here. I run some PowerShell to set up my app. I do that again, this is a weird thing that you have to do because it's a 10 year old application and sometimes there are weird steps. Uh, and then the last thing I've got here is I've got a health check. Which, is, which tells Docker how to check the application inside the container is still healthy. And then I copy in the, the application. So there's a few bits going on here, but it's still 48 lines. Half of them are, are white space lines. Compare this to a 30 page Word document with lots of pictures that say now click here and now install.net and now run the ASP net reg command. This is much neater and it's much more portable because all you need to build this is Docker and the source code. So I would do a Docker image build to make to, to make this happen, but you've already seen that process. Exactly the same process. I would run it on a Windows machine. Docker image build gets me the build package. Docker image push to share it, and then I'm then I'm ready to run it. So again, I already have this deployed to my Kubernetes cluster. So if I go and check this out, uh, oh, that's, oh, I haven't shown you the YAML file. So similar thing to deploy this to Kubernetes. It's got its own service because. In this case, I'm listening on a different port, but of course I could have, uh, I would ordinarily use the standard HTTP port and I would do things by domain name if I was running several apps on one cluster. So this is listening on 8080. I've got my container image here that I want to use. This is the one that I've built and pushed. Uh, I'm saying which ports to use. I'm using exactly the same pattern to get the configuration out of, uh, out of the Kubernetes cluster and into my app. Now, um, the first app that I showed you used the .NET standard config system with the JSON files. This is using the old .NET framework configuration system with the XML config files. It's exactly the same as far as Kubernetes is concerned. I'm going to deploy those XML files as a secret in Kubernetes and make them available to my app in this location, and the app is configured to pull bits of the, app, bits of, bits of the config from there. Okay, and then the last thing I've got here that I need to point out is this node selector. So this is a Docker image. It's pushed to Docker Hub. Kubernetes doesn't know at this point when I ask it to run the app, whether it's for Windows or Linux. So I've given this hint to say, this is a Windows app, so make sure you run it on one of my Windows nodes. Okay, so let's have a look at this. So I've already deployed this to make sure that the demos uh, didn't take all afternoon, morning or evening, depending on where you are. So that's what you can see here. I've already got a deployment that I that I deployed an hour or so ago. Uh, it's running my Nerd in a web application, and I can see there's a service here, and there's my external IP. So exactly the same thing. I've already got a, if I do the kubectl describe secret, and uh, no, what was it called, Nerd Dinner config, then you'll see the same thing. I've uploaded this secret with my SQL Server connection string. It's a connection strings.config file, exactly the same principle that I would use for uh, an ordinary .NET app. Got a web config file that's looking elsewhere for the connection strings. This is already deployed. So this is now running up in, uh, up in Kubernetes. So I can browse to this. Go back to my test browser. 
And if I look at this, there we are, there's Nerd Dinner. So this is my 10 year old application. It was originally written with, with uh, MVC like many, many moons ago. Um, I can log in. This is all connected to, to my SQL Server database. I've already put some information in here. So this is connected to SQL Azure. It's getting the data that I've already run. If I run a new pod, it'll connect to the same container and I'll get the same thing out. So uh, exactly the same kind of workflow for an old Windows app or a brand new .NET Core app running on Linux. OK, so let's have a look here. Let's go back to our slides. OK, so those are the demos. All that stuff on GitHub, you can check it out. So just to, just to kind of recap what I did, because it's not a very long session, I've got my Kubernetes cluster. Now, the great thing about Kubernetes is it's the, kind of the same everywhere. Uh, there are different implementations for different parts of Kubernetes, but the YAML descriptions are always kind of the same. So I can throw this on, a, on my local machine. I can throw it on VMs. I can run it up on AKS in Azure. I've got my cluster. I've deployed my application, deployed my old Windows application. So inside the Kubernetes cluster, there are the secrets that have my, my credentials for my database and my Windows container. And Kubernetes is listening at the top on a particular port, and it will send my, my request into the container. And the container will use the secret to get the connection string and go to SQL Azure. I also have my brand new .NET Core application, exactly the same principles, totally different technology stack. So again, Kubernetes is listening on a public port, passes traffic to my .NET Core container, which is running on Linux. That uses a secret to find the connection string for Postgres, and it all works in the same way. Now, the beauty of this is you've got an awful lot of consistency across all your applications. So all the artifacts are the same. Every app has a Docker file and an application YAML file that describes it. The Docker, if it's a more complicated app, I've shown you sync apps with a single component. If it's a more complicated uh, microservice type application, you just have more Docker files, a Docker file for each part, and the application YAML file brings them all together. The pipeline is always the same, and it's really simple. It's a bunch of command line instructions that you can plug into as your DevOps or Jenkins or GitHub Actions or whatever you're using. Docker image build, Docker image push, kubectl applied to deploy it to your cluster. And then we've got a consistent platform. So for developers who are working, uh, with administrators who are, who are managing the stuff in production, we're using the same set of tools, the same set of artifacts, the same platform. So it's Docker everywhere, Kubernetes in my test and production environments, and it's .NET all the way through. So it's a really nice way to get consistency across a whole range of different apps. OK, and then here is the big list of uh, big list of links. So today's demo is all on GitHub. Uh, if you're interested in how this stuff works and you want to go right back to the beginning, if you follow that link, dac4.net, that's a workshop that I do at various conferences. But all the content's online. You can go to that website and follow along and, and you know take this whole thing much more slowly. Uh, I'm in the process of writing a book, Learn Docker in a Month of Lunches. That's the link to the book. The first five chapters are done. Um, if you want, and the final thing is going to give you a discount to go and buy the whole book when it's when it's ready. So um, thank you very much for listening. We'll take some Q and A if we've got any. Um, but yeah, that's that's what we've got. I can see you pushing buttons, but I can't hear you. Yeah, we, you will hear that. We, we're, we're struggling with the unmute on Skype button. Yes. <laughs> is it unmuted? You can, you can hear us OK, right? All right. I can hear you now, yeah. Perfect. All right, perfect. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, in terms of questions, and I know you're, you've are you just put up some uh, links here, but I think there's a lot of confusion about Kubernetes and not just how to pronounce it. Um, <laughs> so. You know, somebody who's maybe played around with Docker, understands the concept of containers, what, where would you point them to learn about Kubernetes? So starting with what the heck is it? Because it gets pretty deep pretty quickly. Right. Yeah, it's a, that's a really good point. So, I mean, if you look at the learning curve for these things, like the learning curve for Docker is, is pretty straightforward. Um, you can spend a couple of days looking at it and, and find some good samples and you'll be up and running, you know, with your own applications running containers in, in a few days. Um, Kubernetes, the learning curve is very much steeper. Uh, because it is, there are so many abstractions. There, are, it's, it's got a very pluggable framework. Um, there are different ways of doing the same thing. Uh, different release. Uh, it moves so quickly that each new release brings all these interesting features. Um, the, in terms of resources, so so the the Docker docs are always are always great, and it's really you know there's some good examples of how to get that stuff started. Um, and again, the, the 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 main Kubernetes docs are pretty good. Um, if you're looking for something that's specific to .NET, I don't think that's out there yet. So that that link DAC for .NET, um, that's an evolving workshop, and I'm adding more and more Kubernetes content. The trouble is, is is this big gulf between I get the idea of containers, I'm running them locally, and then Kubernetes, which is which is massively more complicated. 
The bit in between, which most people don't do, is Docker Swarm. So Docker Swarm is another container orchestrator. Uh, it's much simpler than Kubernetes because it doesn't have all the features that Kubernetes has, but it's way easier to get started with. So actually, it's a really good learning learning uh, journey is to, to learn how to Dockerize your applications using single containers, then learn about Docker Compose, which tells you how to deal with multi-application, uh, multi-container applications. Then learn Docker Swarm, which you may not use in production, but it's it's much easier to learn Kubernetes when you've got Swarm, uh, when you've got Swarm, an understanding of Swarm, because the the main kind of clustering um, concepts are the same. And Docker Swarm uses Docker Compose as the format to describe all these these multi-container apps. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a good a good good learning path is Docker, then Compose, then Swarm, then Kubernetes. And somewhere along that journey, you may say I've got everything I need, and then I can stop. So you don't have to go to Kubernetes. The big advantage with Kubernetes is um, because it has so many integration points, all the clouds that are that are giving you a hosted Kubernetes service integrate really nicely with the rest of their platform. Right. So, you know, Azure, I get my load balancer, I get my public IP addresses. I don't have to do anything else. I spin up my AKS cluster and it will take care of the rest for me. So, yeah, so that's why, you know, that's why Kubernetes is, is the kind of the poster child for, for cloud native stuff. But, yeah, there is a steep burning curve and, and you, you're going to have to decide whether you need to go all the way. All right, perfect. Thanks so much for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. We're going to get the next speaker up. Who's the next speaker? That's Mike. What is he going to be talking about? Mike is going to be talking about modernizing .NET applications with .NET Core. Sweet. Well, That's right. awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. We're going to stay here. We, we, we shut off the video so, because people were wanting the, the, the links because the way we do the video overlay, they couldn't yeah, see so it, so I kind of shut it off halfway through it. So thank you so much. We'll be right back with more .NET Comp. See ya.